The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene Law 45 Preach change but never reform quickly Everyone understands the need for change in the abstract. But on the day-to-day -day level, people are creatures of habit. Too much innovation is traumatic and will lead to revolt. If you are new to a position of power, or an outsider trying to build a power base, make a show of respecting the old way of doing things. If change is necessary, make it feel like a gentle improvement on the past. Sometime in the early 1520s, King Henry VIII of England decided to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, because she had failed to bear him a son, and because he had fallen in love with the young and comely Anne Boleyn, Boleyn, or something like that. The Pope opposed the divorce and threatened the king with excommunication. The king's most powerful minister, Cardinal Wolsey, also saw no need for divorce, and his half-hearted support of the king cost him his position and soon his life. One man in Henry's cabinet, Thomas Cromwell, not only supported him in his desire for a divorce, but had an idea for realizing it, a complete break with the past. He convinced the king that by severing ties with Rome and making himself the head of a newly formed English church, he could divorce Catherine and marry Anne. By 1531, Henry saw this as the only solution. To reward Cromwell for his simple but brilliant idea, he elevated this son of a blacksmith to the post of royal counselor. So far as we've seen in Law 36, disdain things you cannot have, this strategy was a great success. King Henry successfully impregnated his new, fertile wife and could now rest assured his legacy would carry on. But this new character, Thomas Cromwell, he wasn't in any way subtle about his approach. He envisioned a new Protestant order in England. With the power of the Catholic Church smashed and its vast wealth in the hands of the king and the government. And his ways of going about it were unabashedly bold. He began to seize the holdings in the churches and monasteries of England, putting them out of existence one by one. Virtually overnight, England was converted to a new official religion. A terror fell on the country. Some people had suffered under the Catholic Church, which before the reforms had been immensely powerful, but most Britons had strong ties to Catholicism and to its comforting rituals. They watched in horror as churches were demolished, images of the Madonna and saints were broken in pieces, stained glass windows were smashed, and the church's treasures were confiscated. 1535, powerful revolts in the north of England threatened to topple Henry from his throne. By the following year he had suppressed the rebellions, but he had also begun to see the costs of Cromwell's reforms. The king himself had never wanted to go this far. He had only wanted a divorce. It is critical to understand that change comes with consequences. The man who initiates strong reforms often becomes the scapegoat for any kind of dissatisfaction. Eventually, the reaction to your reforms may consume you, for change is upsetting to the human animal, even when it is for the good. You can see this for example with the YouTube comment section when it changed to this Google Plus thing, when it actually improved but people were still upset, because change is generally a wish people have but dislike when it's happening. Ironic to say the least. The world is and always has been full of insecurity and threat, and we latch onto familiar faces and create habits and rituals to make the world more comfortable. Change can be pleasant and even sometimes desirable in the abstract, but too much of it creates an anxiety that will stir and boil beneath the surface and then eventually erupt. So how does one approach times of reforming change? A simple gesture like using an old title or keeping the same number of a group will tie you to the past and support you with the authority of history. Make a loud and public display of support for the values of the past. Seem to be a zealot for tradition and few will notice how unconventional you really are. Quietly enact a radical change while appearing to safeguard tradition. The changes you make must seem less innovative than they are. If your reform is too far ahead of its time, few will understand it and it will stir up anxiety and be hopelessly misinterpreted. Also, if you work in a tumultuous time, there is power to be gained by preaching a return to the past, to comfort, tradition and ritual. But during a period of stagnation, on the other hand, play the card of reform and revolution, but be aware of what you stir up. Those who finish a revolution are rarely those who start it. You will not succeed at this dangerous game unless you are willing to forestall the inevitable reaction against it by playing with appearances and building on the past. 
As always, be warned, the past is a corpse to be used as you see fit. If what happened in the recent past was painful and harsh, it is self-destructive to associate yourself with it. Even an ugly recent history will seem preferable to an empty space. Fill that space immediately with new rituals and forms. Soothing and growing familiar, these will secure your position among the masses. The perfect example once again is, as detailed in Law 26, keep your hands clean, Cesare Borgia, who was facing a great disdain from the populace from all the gruesome actions that had come with his ascent to the throne. They wanted immediate change or a revolution would have broken out. Cesare picked up on that, blamed Remiro di Orco, made a public display of his spiked up head, and then went on to throw many balls, feeds, hand out food, basically appear like a saint. In short, he calmed the people who had wanted his downfall with prompt change and strategic generosity, as seen in Law 40 with Louis XIV. By leaving the dark past behind and announcing the good times that lie ahead, but we'll talk more about Cesare Borgia in an upcoming video on Il Principe by the Lord of Darkness himself, Niccolo Machiavelli. As always, thanks for watching.